How is everyone? All right, I'm so happy that you're here. It's, it is a real honor because you have at one certain point this year decided to take the leap and do something different about what it is you want to do relating to your career. My goal is that everyone is going to be walking out here of here with a little light bulb over their heads going, okay, I've got this idea, I've got this, I've got some fresh, new, disruptive ways to go about looking for a job. There's a lot to cover. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what are the truths about job seeking? Because I think when people are looking for work, it can become a very personal thing. And you don't know if what is happening is common or if it's just related to you. So here's, here's the most common truths about job seeking. Number one, it's freaking hard, right? Number two, you're gonna face rejection. You will, that's just the way it goes. Um, number three, it is common to not hear back when you've applied for a job. It's the number one complaint I hear from job seekers all of the time. And it sucks, and there ought to be a law, and there ought to be a rule. And in a world of automation, there doesn't seem like there's any reason why every single company, when they put out a job posting, cannot send back an email to the job seeker who has applied and taken their time and put their hard work, blood, sweat, and tears into applying to at least say, we've received your resume. Thank you very much. We are gonna make decisions within the next three weeks. If you have not heard from us, please understand there's a lot of people that are, but at least you know that they've received your resume. But then what happens at that end of that job posting, it says no calls. So that you don't hear for two weeks and then you're like, well, maybe I should call them. And then you see that and go, well, they didn't call. Call them. If, if you haven't heard from them in two weeks, give them a call and, and ask them if they've received your resume. Um, New jobs don't happen overnight, typically. It does take time. Uh, typically, when you're going through a job interview process, uh, it's going to be about a month and a half of work in terms of the interviews uh, before they actually make a job offer. Job seeking is a larger part of managing your overall career. Um, another truth is, yes, you do have to have a cover letter. Um, you hear different things from different people. No, you need to have a cover letter. And we'll talk more about cover letters in a little bit. Yes, you do have to be ready to not only talk about your salary history, but to understand how to negotiate your salary. Another truth is that when you are out talking with people and making those cold calls and networking, it's nothing to be afraid of or to be ashamed of that you're unemployed. Everyone's been unemployed. They, the people that you talk to have been unemployed. The people who are going to hire you have been unemployed. This is what you do when you're looking for a job. Job seeking is about discovery. It's about finding out about yourself and understanding what makes you tick. What are the things, the successes? What are the accomplishments, the achievements? How do you create a package, an authentic package about yourself so that you can put that out there? to employers, and the most number one true truth about job seeking is that no one is unemployable. No one is unemployable. Now let me tell you a little bit about some job seeking traps. Before you write your resume, ask yourself what it is you actually want to do. A lot of people put the resume and they say, I gotta write a resume, I gotta hurry up and write this resume. No, you gotta have some self-discovery and f ask yourself those major questions about what it is that you want to do because everything that's going to go into your resume is going to be designed to what it is that you want to do. Another job seeking trap is not understanding the difference between skills versus experiences versus accomplishments versus successes. All of those things are different things and they all have a place in all of the touch points of the job search from the resume to the cover letter to the interviews. Another job seeking trap is spending all of your time applying for jobs online. If it's 11 o'clock and you're in your pajamas and you're now on your fifth resume that you're sending out online, there's something wrong. 
I had a lady call in, I was on a radio show a couple months ago, and she calls in and she says, Andrew, I've sent over 200 resumes in the last three months. I said, what time is it? She goes, 10.30. I said, are you in your pajamas talking to me on the phone? She says, yeah. I said, you need to get out of your pajamas. You need to get up and start talking to people. It's depressing sitting in front of a computer all day. People, talking to people, interacting with people, understanding where the jobs are and making those cold calls and talking to your networks and talking to the people who are going to be your cheerleaders, that's what's going to help you get motivated. Now, I'm not saying, you know, this is coming from a guy who runs a job board, so it sounds kind of funny. But the fact of the matter is, if you're spending more than 25% of your time on those job boards, just randomly sending off resumes, it's not going to work. <coughs> Another trap is applying for jobs that you're just not qualified for. You need to match at least 75% of the qualifications in that job posting. At least 75%. Now, Maybe every once in a while you'll say, well, that just looks fun, and I'm going to just show, throw my resume out there just for fun to see what happens. That's fine. But the majority of, your, of, of the resumes and the jobs that you're applying for, you have to be qualified for. Now, I say 75 to 80 percent. You might have 75 to 80 percent of the qualifications, but you've never actually flown the space shuttle. So, you know, there's, there's a case by case there. Um, another trap is not answering the questions that have been asked of you when applying, if they're asking for that salary reference, if they're asking for references and you don't put those in the resume or you don't put that attached to your resume or in the application, you, that's just a red flag for them. Another one is waiting until the last minute to apply for the job. So you see the deadline and it's January 31st, and you go, oh, I gotta get my resume in. I guarantee you 90% of the jobs, they're not even looking at the resume, the resumes by then because they've already received enough. Um, being afraid of networking. It's one of the things that I'm going to talk a lot about tonight because networking is, gets, you, you have to get outside of your comfort zone here as it relates to networking. For a lot of people, it is very difficult to answer that million dollar question. So, can you tell me something about yourself? That's a hard question and you have to be prepared and you have to write that question down and write your answer down and practice and practice and practice repeating it over and over and over. Because that question is going to be asked of you at the, at the interview, it's going to be asked of you um, when you're at a networking event, it's going to be asked of you when you are sitting down with somebody for the first time, they're going to say, what is it that you want to do? Tell me about yourself, tell me about your history. One of the ones that is really common is falling into the stinking thinking. And what do I mean by stinking thinking? Stinking thinking is this idea when we don't hear back from a job, uh, when we've applied for a job, we're rational people, right? We sit there and we tell ourselves, okay, I didn't hear back. There's got to be a good reason. I'm too old. No, maybe, maybe my resume stinks. I'm underqualified. I, I sat down with an award-winning salesman, and I sat down with him one time and I said, I looked at his resume and I, we went back and talked about his accomplishments and all the things that he's done and the awards he's won and all of the amount of percentage of his businesses that he's been able to increase and everything, and he was really struggling with his job search. He was about 53, 54 years old. I said, tell me, what are your challenges? He's, and he's, he sits down and he says, well, I'm too old. I'm overqualified for some jobs. I'm underqualified for others. I want too much money here. It's hard for me to take a, a job when I'm not going to make enough money. Um, I'm this, I'm that. He came up with about 15 reasons why he was having a challenge. So I said, okay, okay. So tell me the reasons why you should be hired. And I stumped him. And the person that he looked at in the mirror when he woke up in the morning was this guy who was too old, this guy whose resume stunk, this guy who didn't know how to write a cover letter, this guy who was underqualified, who was overqualified. He was all of these two, two things. And it was one of these things where you find yourself falling into this job-seeking quicksand, where if you don't get the job or you get this kind of rejection, your authentic you starts to disappear and you become this person that you're not. 
and all of a sudden you start messing with your resume and your cover letters. Oh, well, maybe if I don't put in my age or my uh, dates of my job, they won't know how old I am. Guess what? You're going to go to the interview. They're going to know how old you are. <laughs> maybe I should do this. Maybe I should dumb down this. Or maybe I should lie a little bit, tinker with that and say, no, you are who you are. You have values. You have skills. You have experiences. You have education. You have a background. You have all of these things. And you should be proud of that. And those things are valuable to employers. So wiping away that idea of I'm to this, I'm to that is an important, important part in the job seeking a world because if you end up becoming this person that you're not, then you fall into this, this uh, area of desperation. And people can smell desperation. They really can. Now here's the other thing. Falling into the isms. And let me just tell you, isms exist. Ageism, sexism, racism, we just don't like you-ism. I don't like that you're too pretty-ism. I like the handsome guy better-ism. I don't like that you're smarter than me-ism. Human beings are biased, and human beings are irrational. That's going to happen. And there's laws to protect ageism, sexism, racism. There are laws, but they're very, very tough to enforce, and it doesn't help you a lot when you're out there in the workforce. You all of a sudden say, well, I'm going to hire an e or I'm going to file an EEOC complaint. I'm, I, I wish I could say there was something I could do to stop that, but that's going to happen in job search. And people experience that here? Yeah. So let's talk about the ground rules first. So whatever is said here stays here. I don't want anybody to feel insecure or silly about uh, asking any kind of a question or raising a point. There's no dumb questions. Everyone here has a freedom to express an opinion. All criticism is constructive criticism. Let's support each other, let's participate, and let's have some fun. So um, what's a brand? It's a logo. Is it a slogan? An image? Identity? It's a story. So let's look at all of these different logos up here. What do you guys think about when I Point to Mercedes-Benz. What are words that come into your mind? High-end luxury, classy, quality, German ingenuity, expensive. And what about if I said Walmart? Cheap as in quality or cheap as in price? Both. Both? Affordable? Scary. Scary. <laughs> See, any one of these logos, you're going to have words in your mind about what describes those. Others are going to be very emotional. Kool-Aid, oh gosh, fun. I remember that from when I was little. The fact of the matter is, is that when you go into an interview, there's going to be people there that are going to be looking at you as a brand, as a product. And everything that touches on the touch points of your job search is going to be on display there. How you walk in, how you're dressed, your personality, what's in your resume, what's in your cover letter, how you answer all of those different questions. That's all part of your brand. I'm going to show you a video here. And I used to be the head of advertising and marketing at Frontier Airlines. When I first got there in 2003, Frontier was just on this massive growth spurt. And they were competing against all of these bigger airlines. What they didn't create, though, was this sense of really deep loyalty to Frontier, but they were kind of the alternative airline. They had a real problem in terms of their image and their brand. And, and basically, in the focus groups, what we would ask is we'd ask people, so name three airlines in Denver. If Frontier was in the top three, we'd be doing pretty good. Well, we were in the top three less than 50% of the time. And we were really Denver's only local headquartered airline. So that was a real problem. And then the thing is, is that we'd ask what the people that did know about Frontier, what they knew about us. They would say, well, you're that Western airline. You're that airline that goes to Las Vegas, goes to Seattle, and to LA, and to Phoenix. And in fact, we were going to Montreal, to Miami, to New York, to Mexico. We were going all over. In the CEO's office, and I said, well, did you ever think it had anything to do with that slogan across the side that said the spirit of the West? And all these ad agencies came to us, and they said, you ought to talk about low fares, your safety record, new planes. All of the ad agencies that were proposing that we're basically saying this is what everyone else does, so you should do that too. But the company that came in and said, we want to do something completely disruptive, 
we're going to use those animals. Our central location was going to be the tarmac at DIA, and all of these different animals were going to be different personalities that you could love or you could hate. It was a big risk because, you know, there's a graveyard of animals and advertising that didn't work out. But within six months of us starting to run that ad campaign, we were now in the 90th percentile in terms of top of mind awareness. I mean, it was that automatic and it became one of the most beloved airlines for a long period of time in, in Colorado. Now saying all of that, let's go back to the idea of what makes a brand. There's really three elements of a successful brand. There's awareness, there's trial, and then there's repeat. And if you get to that gold coin in the sky called loyalty, that's what companies are really looking for. In our case, you know, yeah, your logo, your slogan, all of those visual types of things, that's about awareness and creating awareness about what you are. And if you can do that, and you can get people to repeat till they're loyal, I will never fly another airline except for Frontier Airlines. The string that holds that all together and what creates a successful brand and why some of those brands that I just showed you are more successful than others is this idea of the brand promise. A promise is authentic. It's not just out there saying meaningless things about why you should fly us. It's actually when they arrive at the airline and all of the things that has been promised actually occurs. And they get off that airline and all of a sudden it's, everything is connected between the awareness, their actual flight, the promise of what they experienced. Now, as a job seeker, you want to create that brand sigh of relief or all of the touch points in terms of your job search. I got a resume the other day and it was a laundry list of skills, but it didn't tell me what that person actually did. It didn't really sell me on the brand of that person. Was he reliable? Did he have success? What were the kind of quantifiable things that that person did in his career? It was just this laundry list of different things. So it's creating a promise about the product. Can that product live up to the brand promise in substantive ways? What about the brand offers value? And what about the brand speaks to its differentiators? So it gets down to this dreaded job question at a job interview, which I talked about a little bit earlier, which scares the bejesus out of most people. So tell us something about yourself. That's a hard question. Where do I start? Well, I started scooping ice cream at Baskin Robbins when I was 14. No, you don't start there. But, it, but it's one of these things where you got to be prepared to start showing folks what your brand value is. What are the elements of your past accomplishments and your history and the things that you bring in terms of your talents and your skills. And so in any branding exercise, one of the main goals is to create differentiators that attract attention and sway perceptions in your brand's favor. And that same theory holds true with job seekers. While it's true the basic criteria for a recruiter is to make sure they possess the key skills and expertise required for the job, there are differentiators that will work in a candidate's favor to get their resumes to the top of the pile, secure an interview, and ultimately a leg up in getting the job offer. Here's some of the basics. And this is what I want everyone to do when they get home, is I want you to write a 300 word narrative about yourself. Some people might find it easy to say, I'm gonna interview myself. What are the things that I need to talk about myself in terms of my history, in terms of my accomplishments. We're professionals with distinct skills. We all have specific differentiators. We all have levels of talent and expertise that employers want and need. You have experience, maturity, you understand various industries, job sectors, you have primary skills and secondary skills. So who are you? So you go into a job interview. They call you back. You have another interview you become a finalist in the job interview. Guess what? Out of about maybe 20 people that have started that interview process, they're now down to the three finalists. Every single one of those three finalists can do the job. They can. The questions that are gonna be asked at that final interview are gonna be a little bit different. And you'll sit and there'll be a panel of people, maybe three or four people that'll be sitting there interviewing you. It might be the HR person, it might be your new manager, it might be somebody else from the department. And they all have their own different ideas about what they think the ideal candidate should be for that position. Now, I've gone in and I've consulted with companies on doing interviewing, and it's always an interesting thing because the person who goes into the interview and answers every question in the way that they think it should be answered, and they take the meaning of the question very literally, and they try to find exactly the right thing to say to that question, 
it's more difficult for them. But the candidate that actually turns that interview into a conversation, that's a whole different deal. And I've seen it happen many, many times where that person who is able to turn that interview into a conversation and then leaves the room, these are the responses that you hear. Exactly what we're looking for, ready to go, confident with bold answers to our questions. They'd have a short learning curve, would fit in quickly. Really made me believe their skills were aligned with this job. She could solve our problem. And believe me, every job posting, it's a problem posting. There's a problem that needs to be solved. That's why they're hiring for that job. They displayed specific experiences that are tied to this job. They really took the time to research and understand us. Now, there was a respected CEO in the New York Times, and they asked him, how do you interview job candidates? And he responded, he says, I have two basic questions in mind. Can you do the job, and would I enjoy spending time with you? Now think about that. Would I enjoy spending time with you? When you are working with people who you see more often than you see your spouse, your dog, your friends, that's, that's an important criteria as to whether or not you're going to be a good cultural fit. You're going to be a good personality fit. And put yourself in the shoes of that person who's interviewing you for the job. They've probably never met you before. They might only know you from your resume and cover letter, but they're about to make a decision and a commitment that means they will most likely be spending more time with you at work than they do at home. In addition, they're trusting that your performance will help to increase the value and productivity of that organization, the department, and on top of that, they're gonna pay you money to do that. It's kinda like speed dating for work. And it's a relatively short courtship. I mean, within a period of a few weeks, that person is bringing you onto their team relatively blind. And so when you're going in for that job interview, after reading through that job posting, after reading through what other people have said during that entire process, and you're in that final job interview, it is now up to you to prepare yourself to demonstrate and show with very specific examples. The and, and provide these answers to these questions. Are you enjoyable and fun to be around? What they're thinking, I have to spend a lot of time with you. I don't want to dread seeing you every day. Are you a suck up? Are you nervous around the boss? Will you get along with my other employees? Would you be a good deputy? Are you gonna be loyal and trustworthy? Someone I can always rely on. Will you watch my back? Will you be a constant yes person or are you willing to challenge me and help me avoid mistakes? Will you be thinking three steps ahead of me? Will you be easy to manage? Are you someone with great enthusiasm who will, keep, uh, who will help me to inspire my team? Or are you going to be a pain in my rear, a complainer and a whiner? Are you a good team player? Do you recognize your role on my team? Can you get along with others? Can you play well with others and not get sucked into office politics? Do you have leadership skills? Can you leverage other team members' strengths? Will you put the team's goals ahead of your own personal ambition? Do you listen intently and follow instructions? What they're thinking about, do you have common sense? Can I rely that I can explain something once and expect that you're going to be able to get that assignment done? Or is this a person, a, a know-it-all, been there, done that? Do you communicate well? Are you a hard worker? Are you creative? Are you innovative? Here's some other responses. I got a really good feeling from them. She had great energy, got me excited listening to her describe her history. Sounds like she'd be easy to get along with. Comes off as a good people person. I can imagine them being part of our department. Man, think about that. You've created an imagination in somebody's head about you being in that department. That's an amazing thing to have done. But let's go back again and talk about branding, right? I mean, here's kind of the intellectual rational side of how they're thinking about you. You know, she could solve our problem, made me believe skills were aligned with this job, they'd have a short learning curve. And here's the emotional side of it. Good feeling, how do you create a good feeling, right? These are the responses that people who didn't do too well got. Disappointed, based on their resume, I expected more. They were way too general, it sounds as if they were making up answers and hoping we didn't notice. Didn't do much research on us. Wow, what a blown opportunity. Where do I go to get my 45 minutes back? <laughs> Ouch. He was so stern, I wish he'd smile a bit and show us some likability. They were so nervous it was difficult to understand their answers. 
Again, that's where practice comes, anticipating answers to questions. You're going to know, when you look at that job posting, you know, they might have a list of 50 different things that they're expecting, but when you interpret that job posting, you're going to know pretty clearly about the top five things that are going to be required of that job and where you should be centering your strengths on. I never heard anything specific to how they could do the job. They were trying so hard, they sounded desperate. I felt like they were lecturing me. In confidence, people respond too well. Confidence is not ego. Confidence is not desperation. Confidence is sitting there and telling people your story about how you succeeded in those previous positions and what it is about me that I was able to do to move the needle and offer value to my former employers and how that's going to translate to what I can do for you. But that's the sweet spot you're always going for is confidence, not desperation and not this overinflated ego either. So one of the things I used to do with the mayor when we would go into tough media interviews, I would say, okay, what are the three things that you want to get across? You need to control the message about what it is that you want to get across to, to everybody who's in that room. I'm the best candidate because examples of my work that is relevant, examples of how I add value to your organization. And as I said, interpret that job posting. What are the three to five things they're looking for? What problems will you be required to solve? And then connect those most relevant experiences, talents, expertise, accomplishments, all of the things that make you the best candidate. Be prepared. That first question is your opportunity to turn that interview into a conversation. Your elevator speech is going to be tailored to the position. Out of the gate, you're the one who's in control of that interview. Make eye contact, smile, be attentive, and listen. No scowls, frowns, nervous tics. Just relax. Going into the next aspect of interviewing is this idea called bridging. Bridging is an old public relations trick. You see it all the time on TV when you see a politician being asked one question and he doesn't want to talk about it and he goes to something else. You have to understand that a lot of the people who are interviewing you, they don't have your expertise. They don't have your background. They don't have your knowledge. And a lot of times you need to find the opportunities to gently educate them about your background. If the goal of an interview is to focus the interviewer on a few key messages that are true, accurate, clear, concise, brief, and memorable, then bridging can significantly increase that probability that your message is going to get across. And by using these techniques, you can refocus or redirect the interview to the points that are most important, relevant, and critical to you. These are some of the statements that you can start out with. If you get asked certain questions, you can start bridging by saying all of these different things. And what's most important to know is, and you go into what is that element about your background, or a project, or an accomplishment, or how you convince the CFO to fund your million dollar project. Um, what is more important to look at is, and you can talk about your expertise and the things that you know based on what you have identified in the job posting itself. If we take a broader perspective, if we look at the big picture, this is an important point because what this all boils down to, the heart of the matter is, all of these things are important ways to use language to create that conversation and to bring people back to your side in terms of helping to identify your value. Think about the bridging statements that you can use. Maybe they're in here, maybe there's something that you can come up with yourself. But again, it's one of these ways to be able to not only turn the, this interview into a conversation, but also to feel in control of the interview, as opposed to being the subject of an interview. And then you're creating this dialogue with the people in front of you. And that's a lot more effective and a lot more powerful when you're talking to folks. So the elevator speech map, again, this 300 word narrative that I want you all to, to, to write about yourselves. We're often the worst people to talk about ourselves because we have the ultimate bias or we have the ultimate fear about whether or not we are bragging too much. Well, guess what? You're at a job interview. They ain't hiring a team. They're hiring a person. You need to have those things that identify why you're valuable to them. Learn to talk about yourself and you're going to repeat things over and over and you're going to get sick of talking about yourself, but that's okay. These are just the kinds of things that you need to talk about. Name, where you're from, definition of expertise, number of years, short chronology showing the progression of your career, key accomplishments and results with emphasis on your most recent position or the position that best defines your skills. Um, and you know, this can be about, you know, I was promoted, I was recruited, all of the things that uh, define the progression of your career and why that should stand out and the positive things. In addition to your expertise, what other skills do you possess that are valuable? You've had to deal with sales and marketing, with HR, hiring and firing. 
Those are also secondary things that you might have had to do in addition to your expertise that you need to bring up as well. Now, yeah, you do have to talk about soft skills. I just want to tell you, you know, I'm a hard worker is not a selling point to an employer. You know, everyone is a hard worker. It's an expectation. It's not a skill. Able to juggle, manage under stress, friendly. They're important things, but you need to qualify those things. And then, of course, you know, you don't want to talk religion or politics, but those kinds of connections are always good to have if, if you can identify those. We are typically the worst people to write our own resumes. Having a professional certified resume writer is one of the best investments you can make. And it is one of these things where a professional resume writer is going to be able to take a look at your background, your history, interview you, work with you very closely to make sure that the things that need to be identified will be identified by an employer. I'm going to show you what I recommend for a resume. Um, and I say this just in terms of the format, and I say it in terms of uh, there's a lot of technical reasons why this kind of a resume has become very popular and is needed. Um, but uh, I also included in one of the sheets I gave you the name of a resume association. It's a National Resume Writers Association. And there's a link on that website where you can search for resume writers um, locally, nationally. Most of them do it virtually no matter what. And then there's also one resume writer who I highly recommend, who have many people I've referred to have used her, and they think she's great. And her name is Ruth Pankratz. Um, if you choose to go that path, interview them. Talk to them. Make sure that there's a, a connection. They'll, they'll give you, they'll, they'll, you know, they're not going to charge you for, for talking with them. Just make sure that, that's, that there's someone that you can get along with and somebody that you think is, uh, is good. But I would highly recommend that they are certified. There's a lot of people out there that write resumes and they say, oh yeah, I'm a resume writer. But a certified resume writer means that they've gone through classes and that they really understand what they're looking for. Typically, they'll also help you with cover letters. They'll also help you with LinkedIn profiles and any other kind of written materials. If you're, if, if you're in a career that needs uh, a CV that is a little bit more technical in nature, um, they should be able to help you with that as well. Now, saying all of that, every resume must be customized to the job posting. Now, I know that seems really overwhelming when you say it out loud, but a resume is a branding document. It makes a promise about the product. You are the product. And it backs up the promise by displaying relevant, accurate connections to accomplishments, expertise, skills, background, and experience. These things are as specific to the job you are applying for. It also establishes you as a professional person with high standards, excellent writing skills, based on the fact that the resume is so well done, clear, well organized, well written, well designed, highest professional grades of printing and paper. So it's also one of the most important exercises for you, the job seekers, because it requires you to clarify, focus, organize, prioritize the most established experiences, skills, and accomplishments that best define you. These are just some of the things that will pop out in your resume. It's also pleasing to the eye so that the reader is enticed to pick it up and read it. It creates an imagination of you as the new employee, stimulates interest in meeting you and learning more about you, and inspires the prospective employer to pick up the phone and ask you to come in for an interview. Now, a few years ago, there was a company called Ladders. Ladders is a job board. They advertise jobs that pay $100,000 or more. Now, the flip side of that is you have to pay a subscription to be able to go to ladders.com. I recommend it for the bigger media markets like LA, Chicago, San Francisco, Miami, and things like that. Most of the jobs locally, you can find other places without having to pay. But they do have a really wonderful amount of job seeking advice on there. They did a study in which they put on um, to these HR recruiters, they used this eye tracking gear that tracked the heat of where they would stop and look at resumes. And they were basically. <clears throat> They, they, they wanted to see where their eyes were darting back and forth on a resume to see, you know, what were the hot spots that people were paying most attention to. Recruiters were only spending six seconds looking at resumes before they made a decision on to whether or not that job seeker was going to end up in the interview pile or into the circular file. And it was astonishing to, you know, career people because they, they had always been giving this advice that, oh, you know, They'll spend a good 90 seconds looking at your resume before they make a decision. Six seconds. Think about that. One, two, 
three, four, five, six. And they've made a judgment about you in six seconds. In short, the study confirms that resumes have to be succinct, easy to follow, written with confident language, and relevant and specific connections to the job you are applying. Now, it also confirmed that you do have to create your resume with a strategic visual pattern that will allow the reader to quickly grasp bursts of relevant information. In fact, the study said recruiters tended to follow a consistent visual path when reviewing both resumes and online profiles, so an organized layout is crucial because professionally written resumes have a clear visual hierarchy and present relevant information where recruiters expect it. These documents quickly guide recruiters to a yes-no decision. Matter of fact, 60% of the resumes that made it into the interview file were written by professionals. The study's gaze tracking technology showed that recruiters spent almost 80% of their time looking at the following data points. Name, current title company, previous title company, previous position start end dates, current position start end dates, and education. Again, a final point of the study is that self-written written resumes fared much worse than resumes written by a professional. For most job seekers, it's difficult to understand their key areas that make a resume pop for success. But professional resume writers have experience in understanding what the critical points of your background, expertise, and accomplishments are. And more importantly, they know how to craft a resume that helps to define these important areas of your history that will grab a recruiter's attention. So the gaze trace of recruiters was erratic when they reviewed a poorly organized resume and they experienced high levels of what is considered cognitive load, total mental activity, which increased the level of effort to make a decision. Professional resumes had less data, were evenly formatted, and were described as clear. Once you have a resume that is professionally written and is, and is designed in the way I'm going to show you, it's actually quite easy to customize it for each job that you are applying for. Because what you're looking for is, again, the keywords and key phrases that are in that job posting when you interpret it. About 30 years ago, a company was created called Monster.com. Monster.com was supposed to be the cure-all for recruiting and for applying for jobs. You add in a few terms and addresses and you know search terms, whatever, zip, all these jobs come up. And it was, it was really great for a while. I mean, it was uh, other job sites started coming on as well, career builder, jobbing, hot jobs, all these different websites. But the problem is, is that most of those bigger job sites literally became monsters. Um, for the job seekers, you're now um, competing against people from across the world. For employers, they're now having to sort through 50, 60, 700, 800 different resumes that are being sent to them. And so to combat that, the employers created these things called applicant tracking systems. And applicant tracking systems are basically these very sophisticated um, databases that are searching for key terms and key phrases and qualifications. And in fact, when you send in your resume or your application, you're being ranked by a computer, not by a human being. Now knowing that, it's important uh, in terms of how you format your resume. And it's why I say you have to customize your resume to the job posting. It's primarily for key phrases and key words. Now, I had one person who told me, I thought this was brilliant, actually. Have you ever gotten into one of those job applications where it says copy and paste your resume into this big box and that drop down and everything, and it all it takes it all completely out, uh, out of format, and it, you never know if it's going to actually get in there or whatever. Well, what this guy says he does is that at the end of that big box where he cuts and pastes his resume, he takes the job posting and puts it in clear font and tags it onto the end. <laughs> so the computer reads the whole job posting and gets every keyword and every key phrase that is, that is necessary in there. Now, I'm not saying you should do that, but you could get busted for that, I suppose. But you know what? It's a, it's, it's a game, and you know there's no rules, really. I mean, why not? But actually, some of these things are important. I mean, you got take the time to research the company. Take the time to research the people. And it's important. And don't ever lie or exaggerate just to get through the screening process. I mean, that's, you're, you're, you're going to get caught, and it's just not worth it. And, so um, I'm going to go into what I call the top of line, bottom line resume. 
And this is the pretty typical type of resume that you're going to see out there right now. And the thing that is easy to format and easy for you to be able to customize as well. This is, this is somebody who I worked on. And I said, the top of line is really a summary of your experience and who you are and your brand statement, per se. So results-oriented nonprofit professional focused on nonprofit leadership, growth, and sustainability. I'm recognized for developing creative, integrated, and quality-oriented fundraising programs. All right, that's pretty good. Here's what we did. I'm an accomplished senior executive with expertise in nonprofit leadership, strategic planning, development, and fiscal management. I excel in creating outcome-based fundraising programs and am recognized for developing creative, quality-oriented campaigns that fulfill the mission of the nonprofit. I possess demonstrated analytical, problem-solving, decision-making, and follow-through capabilities. I'm happiest in a fast-paced, result-oriented environment. Areas of expertise include, and then there's these columns. Now, why do we do these columns? This is where you can add the key words and the key phrases. You can add them up here as well once you've, once you've recognized that, but this is the area where you're free to customize and use to get it through the applicant tracking system. It's also your branding statement. This is the thing that's going to drive people to say, okay, I want to read a little bit more about this person. Now here's the final resume. A nice, clean border, soft edged fonts. It's funny. You don't think about this, but this is actually also uh, proven that people who read hard, like New York Times, Roman, things like that, hard edged fonts, it's, it becomes difficult after a period of time doing that. If you have your resume in a soft edged font, it's easier to read. Here there's a quick statement that talks about what they did at this particular company with a few bullets that are both quantifiable. If you have, if you have ways to quantify your work from a financial perspective, increase $23 million of assets if you're in sales. Anything that you can use to quantify is great. And you have the dates, you have the title, the company. Very easy, uh, very uh, simple, and very streamlined to be able to read. And this is the kind of resume that um, most professional resume writers will help you write. Typically, you don't need a picture on there. You don't need fancy colored paper or interesting graphics or logos or things like that. I highly recommend that it be no longer than two pages. Now, unless you're just an entry-level employee and you don't have a lot, you can do, you get away with one page. But most people who are in their mid-careers, people who are, um, have a background, if you try and fit everything onto one page, number one, you're going to make it immediately unreadable because you're going to put it in like eight-point font and it's going to go from edge to edge, side to side, and it just makes it impossible to read. And there's no reason for it. You're, never going to, you're not going to get um, uh, red flagged for having a two-page resume. It just won't happen. Um, now, some people have also asked, you know, okay, so how do I hide my age? Do I have to tell them the, the dates I was here? I mean, what if I've had, there's a million and one different ideas about how far back you should go and so forth and so on. And it's all case by case, depending on the individual. So I, there's no real common rule about that. Um, now, you don't have to go back to when, you know, you were a busboy at a restaurant when you were 14 years old. Um, primarily, you know, go back, you know, 15 years at the most. Um, but again, it, it could be different for some people who have been at one job for 15 years. Now, let's talk about what the corporate recruiters are looking for. We talked a little bit about how they were looking in terms of resumes, but corporate recruiters get a bad rap. They're professionals, they're experts in recruiting and human resources, and they're also experts in helping to identify what their uh, managers want in terms of employees. The recruiting process, chaos is typical. They're not just recruiting for one employee, they're recruiting for a lot of different employees, a lot of different departments, and there's personalities involved, and they're doing everything they can to keep things organized. They're typically generalists. I mean, there are subject matter recruiters that are very specific to certain things, but typically in companies, they're going to be generalists. They'll get the request from someone to post a job. And this is kind of what they go through. They look at the salary. They look at the skills, personality, years of experience. Um, if they don't have a job posting that they can dust off from the last person who had that job, they'll be creating one from scratch. They'll be looking at um, salary based on location, based on years of experience, all of the things that are associated with that to, to typically come up with a range, not a one salary number, but a range based on all of those different things. They'll post it on their website. They'll network. They'll put it on LinkedIn. They'll put it on my site, I hope. 
when I say network, one of the things that a lot of companies do is they're paying big bonuses to their own employees for helping to track and, and uh, attract good talent. So if you know people at companies that could get, you know, I mean, I've, I've, there's companies out there that are paying two, three thousand dollars if you can get, if you can help attract. And typically, the employees are the best resources for their companies. They know the culture, they know what's expected, they know the industry, they're tied into professional associations. They'll do a phone screen. Now, phone screens are funny, right? That very first phone screen you're going to get is going to be uh, to basically just check in with you and to determine whether or not you know, you're um, what you say you are on paper and they're just kind of doing a test to see if they want to bring you in for an interview. 99.99% .99 of the time, I want you to say, can I call you back? You're going to have five, six resumes out there. This one company is going to be calling you and you answer the phone and you don't want to wing it. You want the job posting in front of you. You want your resume in front of you. And they'll be fine with that. You know, come up with a, a predetermined time about what time you can talk. I mean, I've heard horror stories from HR people who have said, you know, yeah, we do the, the, the phone screen. And I got this one call and the lady says, well, I'm, I'm just about to go into a job interview. Can we make this quick? <laughs> I mean, other people, well, I'm driving down the street, but I guess I got a couple minutes. I mean, no, there's, that's, you know, and, and some of that is, is, again, desperation or just, you know, they're not very... Um, savvy about this, but just ask if you can call it back. Then you can be in a comfortable place on the phone with that job posting in front of you and being able to, it's every time you have a shot at talking to an employer about them hiring you, it's an important one. And look, these HR recruiters, they want to be your advocate. They really do. At the end of the year, they have a performance review as well. And the one question that gets asked is, did you recruit the best people for our company? They have skin in this game. They want to make sure that you are the best person for that job. Here's some of their biggest complaints. Resumes from job seekers that aren't qualified for the job. Happens all the time. I was working with a recruiter on a job posting the other day. Out of the 40 resumes that she got, she said that 30 of them were people that just looked like they didn't read the job posting. They just were not qualified. Typos, yeah, they're looking very specifically to see whether or not you are detail-oriented. I, I remember getting resumes when I was at Frontier, and it was addressed to Dear Manager of United Airlines. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> um, they don't connect the relevance of their background to the job posting. There's gaps. There's unexplained dates. Don't, don't have a gap. You know what? I've worked with people who have been stay-at-home parents. That's a job. It's transportation management. It's scheduling. All of those different things. And it might seem kind of funny, but it's, it's a lot easier to explain, you know, the kinds of things that you've been doing as opposed to them having to pick up the phone and say, why is there a five-year gap in your resume, which they typically won't do. We'll just move on to the next person. Um, I've had people who have had to take care of sick parents or they had a medical issue of their own. Those are easily explainable and they're not going to disqualify you but most likely you will be disqualified if there's a big gap staring them in the face. Lack of research on the company, unprepared to answer questions, unprepared to ask questions, or surprises, because they're gonna be doing background checks, they're gonna be doing things. I mean, be up, be up front, let people know. Don't assume that you're gonna be disqualified for whatever condition. If, they, if you've been fired, if you've been laid off, or if there's some other condition that is, uh, is causing you to be unemployed, there's nothing wrong with talking about that. Believe me, there's a lot of people out there that have been uh, uh, fired or, or let go for various reasons. Here's the frequently asked questions about recruiters. Why don't I get a call back? It is pretty chaotic. I wish that there was a rule that recruiters did at least acknowledge that they got your resume. What if the posting says no calls? If they don't reach out to you within two weeks, call them. Call the administrative assistant in the department. I, I tell you, I, I get so far when I can sweet talk as an administrative assistant at the front desk and just you know be prepared call them and say hey you know what I, I applied for this job a couple weeks ago and you know I'm really excited about it why do you like working there I'm just curious and then just get them into a conversation say hey, would, would you mind just going and looking making sure that my resume is there can I send it to you can you get it in front of somebody do you use LinkedIn I mean they're gonna be looking on LinkedIn they're gonna be searching your social media feeds they're gonna be looking a lot at that how do I get my name in front of a recruiter? 
we'll talk about that in a minute in terms of networking. And should I take a contract to start? That's a very popular thing right now, is they want to test you out, so they want to put you under contract as a 1099 employee. You know, that could be uh, something that people would like to consider or even suggest. I mean, I know a lot of people who go to my website who are, they like to work under contract. And they look at my website and they'll see a job posting and you can kind of tell that this company doesn't really know what it wants. It's kind of like in between. And if you can call them up and say, look, you know what? I can save you guys a lot of money by putting me on a retainer contract. You don't need a full-time employee for this job, but someone who has my skills, I could do this job, you know, 20 hours a month and, and save you guys a lot of money and then you get yourself a nice juicy contract. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about LinkedIn. Does everyone here have a LinkedIn profile? Let me see, anybody who doesn't? It's important to establish an online presence. Your LinkedIn profile, it's become so important. I mean, even if you have business cards, put your LinkedIn profile on the bottom of your business card so that people can easily access your resume and your profile and all of the things that you have onto LinkedIn. Collect recommendations. If you have former clients, former vendors, uh, employees, managers, if you're that close with them, write out a recommendation and send it to them and say, hey, would you mind posting this as a recommendation for me? Because a lot of times they're very busy and they can't do that. You can find jobs. They've got an excellent job board on LinkedIn that you can search for jobs as well. Find people, become connected. Again, former vendors, friends from high school, from college, um, anytime you can be connected. And this is something that I would re recommend you do. Next to your name, in parentheses, put L-I-O-N. And that is the universal code for LinkedIn Open Network which means you're willing to connect with just about anybody and you're also, you're actively looking for a job. So recruiters see that and they will know. And it's very interesting because it's like when I'm researching companies, all of a sudden, you know, first, second connections come up as being connections to, to that company. They've either worked there, they've done business with them or whatever. And it's an easy way to then send an email to somebody or a message within LinkedIn and say, hey, what do you know about this company? Using it to gather business intelligence, there's tons of information that you can get on LinkedIn about companies, about em, uh, um, employers, individuals. And then show traction through regular updates. There's terrific groups on LinkedIn. You can uh, search for groups that is relevant to what you're looking for. So if you're in healthcare marketing, I guarantee you there's a Denver healthcare marketing group. And there's good information. A lot of times recruiters will go straight to those groups to post the jobs themselves. Networking, it's a challenge. I know it's hard for people to think, oh my gosh, how do I just like call up somebody and make a cold call? How do I call, you know, an old friend and say, you know, can I have you help me find a job? I always divide it this way. Three different, very succinct groups of networking partners. So the first one is going to be your power partners. Your power partners is that top prospecting list. The people who know you best, they'll be a cheerleader, they'll be an advocate, it includes former colleagues, bosses, vendors, clients, people throughout your career who you've impressed with your hard work. They're the ones who may have said at one time, if you're ever looking for a new job, call me. They're the type of people who are willing to pick up a phone and testify to your talent, your work ethic, your expertise. They'll open up their Rolodex. They will give you a reference letter. They'll do whatever they can to help you. And make that list of people and keep in regular contact with them and let them know how it's going. Sit down with them. Uh, have them uh, work with you on your interviewing skills. Those are, these are going to be the folks that are really going to be the, the, the folks on the front lines for you, helping you. That tier two is the kind of the remember me. That's the list of people that you might not have seen in a while, but maybe you haven't even worked with them, but they're aware of you. You're close enough of an acquaintance that you'd be comfortable reaching out to them. Maybe it's someone you worked on on a volunteer committee for a nonprofit or someone you've met through your work at a professional association. Maybe it was somebody who was a counterpart at a competing business where you both have professional respect for each other. They know a little bit about your background and um, they have knowledge of the industry. The third one is the toughest, but it's just as critical as the other two. That's the let me introduce myself. And this is going to be that list of family, friends, neighbors who might not know your background as well, but they have an in at their company. Maybe it's somebody from your church or your synagogue or somebody from your kid's little league team, the parent who you know works for a company that you're interested in. Um, someone you want, can tell about their company and share your resume with them and anyone in your day-to-day -day circle of interactions that can source, be a source for employment. 
Now I'll tell you, there's also some unorthodox ways to network as well. Uh, a good friend of mine named Linda Soller, she runs a consulting business for people who are reinventing themselves. She's a reinvention expert. She's terrific. If you ever want to check her out, go to creatingpurpose.com. And she does, uh, she does terrific work with people who are kind of in uh, that, that mid-career change and want maybe to do something completely different. Anyway, she had gotten her master's degree in human resources from DU. Just gotten out of school, and she really, really wanted to work for Jefferson County government. And she would send in her resume whenever she saw a job posted. And she would typically get a thanks but no thanks letter, or sometimes she wouldn't hear back, but she knew she was in their files somewhere. And so she decided to take matters into her own hands. And there is a King Supers not far from the big Taj Mahal in Jefferson County. And so she went out there for th three days straight, on a Wednesday, a Thursday, and a Friday, from 11 to 1, dressed professionally, had her portfolio with her resumes in there, and as people walked in through the King Supers, she would walk up to them and say, Hi, my name's Linda. Do you happen to work for Jefferson County government? Or do you know somebody who does? And some people would give her the stink eye and, weirdo. But she said that most of the time people were very polite and she ended up getting a lot of connections of people that were actually had a connection to Jefferson County government. I mean, the idea was to find people who were coming in for lunch or grabbing a sandwich or something. But it was a husband of somebody who worked there or a wife. But after three days, she had given her spiel to 16 people. And she was ready. This is who I am. I just got a degree. I want to work at Jefferson County government. And, you know, spent two minutes telling them a little bit about herself. And then she had to ask. And the ask was this. Will you take my resume and share it with whoever you know? Or can you take it to the HR office and drop it on the desk? So she did that. And she went home. And a week goes by. She doesn't hear anything. And she's getting a little frustrated or wasted time or whatever. And Monday morning, the second week, phone rings. Lady, this is so-and-so, the head of HR at Jefferson County Government, and I've got 15 copies of your resume on my desk. <laughs> and she ended up getting a job working at Jefferson County Government that way. Now, if I was to say, it's that easy, let's all go to King Supers and start handing out our resumes. But my, my point is this. Again, getting out from behind that computer and actually engaging with people, going to networking events, cold calling people. You see a company that you're interested in. You see a person that is, maybe there's something that was written about them in the newspaper. Write them a letter. Make a phone call. Have a script. Be prepared in terms of what it is that you're going to say to that person. And also be prepared to make an ask. Any salesperson worth their salt knows that a pitch ain't worth nothing unless you have an ask attached to it. And the ask might be, do you got a job? An ask might be, can you introduce me to your head of HR? An ask might be, will you open up your Rolodex and give me three good names that I can call and use you as a reference? That's part of the game. I, I've heard from so many people, oh, I take people to coffee. I brought bagels to this one company. And they looked at my resume and said, oh, this is really great. Yeah, thank you so much for coming by. But then I never heard from them. And I said, well, what did you ask them? They said, what do you mean? I said, did you ask them for a job? No. Did you ask him to help you? Did you ask him to, I mean, there's, you, you got to make the ask. Where do you find the jobs? Okay, read the newspapers every day. And I know you can go online and read the newspapers. One of the things that I really recommend is, this is called the Book of Lists. And the Denver Business Journal prints this every December. And it is really a job-seeking Bible. It is, um, has lists of companies and they all, they, they, um, the criteria for these companies is based on number of employees, uh, revenue, profits, all of those things. But it's just a really solid, good look at the types of companies out there in just dozens and dozens of industries. It's not all the companies in Colorado, but it's a really, really good reference point. The other one is the Metro Economic Development Corp. That is the uh, economic development arm of the Denver Chamber of Commerce. And they have tons of research and companies and 
The Denver Business Journal in general is a really good place just to read about what's going on in terms of trends in the economy. Volunteer for a favorite nonprofit or a charity. So many great um, uh, nonprofits out there, something that you like, something that you're interested in, uh, and get involved. Nonprofits are not no paycheck. You can make a good living at a nonprofit. And then keep the job boards that are most helpful bookmarked. Again, I highly recommend you know, only keeping about 25% of your time looking on job boards and using them for prospecting, not for just sending out resume after resume after resume. Um, these are some of the ones that I always recommend, of course mine, and um, the corporate job boards. If you can apply directly to a company as opposed to uh, an applicant tracking system on a different job board, try and find the job posted on the company's website before you apply for it. Association job boards, aggregators like Indeed, LinkedIn, niche job boards, big job boards, I, I made a big list of them. I know this might seem really overwhelming for people, but if you're in a full-time job search, these are the kinds of things that you need to think about. Even though this seems overwhelming, and even though this seems crazy that, oh my gosh, I'm gonna spend this time, this time, this time in doing it, trying to fit these types of things into your job seeking schedule. And I'm not talking about just sitting, in, sitting at home in your pajamas. I mean, get up in the morning, take a brisk walk around the block. Start doing all of the things that you would do if you were actually employed, because you actually are employed. Your full-time job now is looking for a job. This is gonna get you in that professional job seeking mindset. And then you can start thinking about all of these different things. And I'm not saying do all of this stuff, but it's just some ideas about how you can organize your day. But set a goal too. I want to send out five resumes this week. I want to get five interviews this month. And that's where you're aiming for in terms of your goal. And you're going to start to see in terms of your own personal habits, in terms of how these things work and what works best for you. But always keep it moving forward. And even when you get frustrated, stop looking for a job for a day. Go take a hike. Clear your mind, start thinking about it, different ways to do it. Disrupt the way you're looking for a job and come back refreshed. Also, at the end of the day, five o'clock, that's when you stop and turn it off. Go enjoy the time with your family, with your friends. Um, go cook dinner with your wife, do whatever you need to do. But don't just take this with you 24 hours a day. It can be very, very overwhelming mentally to just have this weight on your shoulders all the time. I promise, if you start to do it this way and keep it organized, you're gonna to start to see progress. Recognize the stress in your life, develop that specific job plan, manage your time, maintain healthy habits, stay committed to your beliefs, your customs and your routines, learn to relax, surround yourself with positivity, set goals, make time for yourself, communicate and laugh a little. All right, well thank you very much for coming. I hope this was helpful.